I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. Our next interview is with Matthias Biskorski, a dissident Polish thinker and former member of the European Parliament, clamped down by the neocons of the US and jailed for three years in Poland. Today he is released and will share with us his views and how he has angered the deep state on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Matthias Piskorski, Polish politician, parliament member, journalist, political scientist, and former deputy of the Polish Sejm for the party Self-Defense of the Republic of Poland, founded Zimiana in 2015. The backbone of the party consists of activists from both left and right-wing anti-liberal political structures who decided to act together against liberal hegemony in support of traditional values. Polish national identity, and social justice. Piskorski's party managed to transcend the left-right division and establish a consolidated anti-liberal political force. Matthias Piskorski is a political neo-Eurasian activist, expert and publicist, and proponent of de-Americanization of the European continent. In May 2016, shortly before the NATO summit, he was arrested. This was exactly after attending the New Horizon Conference in Iran. He was suspected of spying for Russia and possibly China. But none of these were proven and after three years in prison, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detentions called for his release. He was released on a 125,000 euro bail. Thank you so much, Matthias, for this opportunity. I look forward to seeing you for many years, uh, and we all look forward to seeing you free and out of prison. Uh, uh, we appreciate your uh, courage. Uh, you represent a lot of people in the world who stand up against uh, siege and oppression. Um, and I'm so happy that you're back with your family now. Uh, let me begin. My, my first question is, what lesson did you learn these three years in prison in Poland? And because you have so much time to think, it's like a think room. What happened during these three years? What process did you come up with? What new ideas did you come up with? You can share it with the audience. Well, this is uh, not a lesson only per personally for me, but uh, we might even say that uh, the things which were done to me uh, were actually a kind of uh, threat, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a kind of uh, suppression against all uh, freely thinking people, against uh, all those who are against uh, the regimes controlled by the US, uh, everywhere. Uh, the process has started in uh, Central and uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, I think that, uh, well, when it comes to the systems, the regimes of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, they are totally under control of uh, United States, even more than the Western European countries, as you know. Uh, that's why uh, they prepared some kind of, uh, I would call it an ex experiment, an uh, experimental way to shut the mouth of uh, dissident uh, voices here, of dissident people here. and. Uh, this is actually a lesson for all of us uh, because uh, I'm totally sure that uh, perhaps they have started to do it here in uh, Central European countries because this is not, not only the case about Poland, 
We have political prisoners in uh, Latvia, in Lithuania, in uh, Estonia, so in the Baltic countries, uh, just uh, near, just near Poland. Uh, so this is a kind of experiment. If uh, the whole thing works here in Central Europe, I'm uh, pretty sure that they will start to um, realize the same scenario in uh, Western European countries uh, under the pressure from uh, United States. The whole thing uh, and the whole precedent, I would say, about uh, my case is that uh, it's for the first time in a contemporary European Union that someone has been directly accused of uh, trying to influence public opinion. So uh, actually for uh, giving his public opinions about uh, different political issues, about different issues of international relations and so on. So voicing an opinion, a dissident opinion, uh, for the first time in the um, contemporary history of uh, Europe becomes a crime, a crime uh, for which you can spend uh, several years in jail uh, without a trial. So uh, anyway, you are suppressed, you are deprived of uh, possibility of any kind of public activism. Uh, and uh, well, I would say this was a kind of a warning to all uh, dissident uh, movements, to all dissident activists in uh, Poland, uh, as well as in other countries um, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, and I fear that this, is on, that this is only a start. This is the, the, the thing they have started with. Uh, and I, I do really hope that uh, anyway, people will not be afraid because as I used to write uh, to several of my comrades when I was writing uh, to them uh, the letters from the prison, uh, they cannot shut uh, every one of us uh, under the bars. They cannot put every one of us uh, in jail. So the more we are here, the more active we are here, uh, the less probable is uh, that they will start uh, some massive uh, repressions uh, against dissident voices. Uh, Matthews, you mentioned in your interview um, that in another interview, something very interesting, and you repeated that several times. The neocons have a lot of pull in Poland. They have a lot of influence. How, mu how much influence do the neocons have in jailing you? Well, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, when it comes to the regimes of uh, Central Europe, uh, those regimes are 100% uh, authoritarian now. So they even do not pretend, uh, they do not create any kind of illusion of democracy as it used to be before. Because uh, uh, before, several years ago in the 90s, in the, in the first years of uh, 21st century, uh, we had a kind of uh, democratic illusion of the liberty of uh, political uh, activism, uh, of uh, the freedom of speech and so on. Now, uh, according to the neoconservative uh, authoritarian uh, idea, they even do not want to pretend anymore. And this is also something, something very let's say, valuable, uh, what I have noticed and what I have learned from uh, my own case, from my own uh, suffering uh, under the, behind the bars. So uh, there's no more such uh, thing, such slogan as uh, liberal democracy here in Central European countries. Uh, before, of course, there was a kind of uh, censorship, a hidden censorship. I was a victim of this censorship for several years, being even, even being a member of parliament here in Poland, I could not voice uh, openly my opinions about the policy policy of the United States in Europe and elsewhere, uh, because I, I was simply not invited to uh, state-owned uh, TV and radio channels at that time, yes? But this was the liberal, let's say neoliberal, uh, pseudo-democratic way of uh, treating the opposition. Now they have come to a next stage. This is a neoconservative, authoritarian way to treat the opposition to treat the dissidents. And uh, uh, for the moment being, it happens uh, only in Central Europe, as I have uh, already noticed, just a few countries, uh, four, maybe five countries, you could add uh, Romania, perhaps in some time uh, Bulgaria. So uh, this is coming, uh, this is happening now here, yes? Uh, the, the authoritarian neoconservative wave to cope with the opposition. Uh, anyway, I fear that the illusion of the so-called democracy will also um, uh, be finished in, uh, in, uh, in the coming years in uh, 
other European countries. When it, when it comes to neoconservatives uh, influences here in Poland, well, uh, to be honest, uh, of course, I'm a great big patriot of my country, of my own country, but uh, to be honest, uh, I'm very sorry to tell you that uh, there's no more such a country as uh, sovereign Poland for the moment being. Uh, for the moment being, we could say, as uh, I, I sometimes even joke to and use the name of Polo Rico. You know, it's a kind of uh, like like uh, Port, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico in uh, Central Europe. So we are a kind of uh, a country, a territory with a with status which is quite similar to that of uh, Puerto Rico. So it is it's an American colony uh, for the moment being, a colony uh, which uh, a territory, a population, a nation which is so humiliated now, because can you imagine that for the first time in the whole Polish history, which has uh, over a thousand years, I mean, the, the, the history of the Polish state, uh, we had a situation when uh, Polish government, Polish president, publicly stood on their knees, kneeled on their knees uh, before the American, before the US president, and asked him to send here more troops to create and build more military facilities on our own territory. So it's a kind of another precedent that, uh, well, before no one has openly asked the US uh, military to, let's say, occupate, actually to occupate, to occupy a, a given territory. Uh, it happened for the first time here in Poland. Now it happens, the same happens in Lithuania. Just uh, two weeks ago, uh, there was an announcement of uh, Minister of Defense of Lithuania, who is also, also officially asking the Americans to uh, build their military bases on the Lithuanian territory. So uh, this is something, uh, well, this is something new in the history of Central Europe, we would say. And uh, this is something that clearly shows that we have a status of uh, US-controlled colonies for the moment. Yeah. Uh, Matthews, I know that Russophobia plays a very big role in all of this. Um, but I want to hear what your account of this aspect, Russophobia, has with all these countries around you and how America is worried that uh, the Russia is, ha has an influence, especially Russia that is, has now influence in the Middle East, is today parading in the Persian Gulf with the Iranian Navy, it's in Syria. Uh, people are very upset that uh, Bashar al-Assad has survived, and one aspect of that has been the aerial assaults of the Russian uh, Air Force against Daesh and ISIS. What, what role does Russophobia play in these clamping down on these Eastern European countries? Well, if you read uh, the classics of uh, psychological manipulation of the masses, like, uh, for instance, uh, the great uh, French sociologist uh, Gustave Le Bon, uh, he wrote that it's very easy to manipulate the masses if you point out at an enemy, at a threat, which is outside the country. Yes? So, uh, for the moment being, uh, this uh, mythical uh, threat uh, in Central European, in Eastern European countries, is Russia. There is a kind of... Uh, uh, to say it in Latin language, to paraphrase it in Latin language, a kind of uh, argumentum ad putinum. So if someone is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, disliked by the ruling uh, political party or ruling circles, they accuse him of uh, having strange hidden ties with uh, Russia and uh, with uh, its president Vladimir Putin, who is openly in Central European countries compared to uh, Adolf Hitler. So we have a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, popular uh, journals, popular um, uh, politicians, even some media stars who um, uh, promote the idea that Russia is not a normal country, that it's a kind of totalitarian state, which uh, poses a threat to uh, all uh, peace-loving uh, Central European countries. And uh, this propaganda has been uh, run by the Americans, uh, of course, by the American uh, American foundations, American uh, think tanks, American Americans uh, who tend to be presented here in Poland as, uh, let's say, uh, people with great experience and uh, knowledge about international relations. Uh, before it was uh, Zbigniew Brzeziński, a well-known uh, American uh, geostrategist of 
with Polish origins, of course. So um, before he died uh, two years ago, he was always quoted as, let's say, the most representative uh, thinker in uh, international relations theory of the contemporary world and so on. Uh, then uh, you can see also the cultural, uh, the cultural level of uh, this Russophobia, which means that uh, since around 30 years, uh, all the TV channels uh, focus on uh, US produced uh, movies, US produced films, which, also, which of course present Russia as a threat for all free world, yes, and uh, which present the Americans as those fighting with the uh, dangers, dangers uh, for democracy and, and freedom coming from Russia. It's, it's quite simple, yes, but, uh, well, people uh, who are manipulated by an authoritarian regime need to have uh, an enemy which is, which is clearly defined by the authoritarian uh, uh, authorities uh, here in Poland. Uh, one of those enemies is uh, Russia, of course. It's on the first place, I would say, on the on the list of the enemies, on the black list of the enemies of uh, Central European authoritarian regimes. Uh, but uh, well, maybe I guess that on the second place there is Islam, which is which is also presented here as a threat for uh, Central European countries. Uh, although we have uh, very small uh, Muslim minorities here, yes. So. But, but the same mechanism is used here to, to show uh, the threat, the possible danger, and, you know, to explain, they, they are using it, abusing it to explain why they are interfering into the liberties, the civil liberties, limiting the civil, civil liberties. First, they, they show the threat of, uh, let's say, uh, the so-called uh, Russian uh, green men, uh, uniformed green men who, according to them, have uh, occupied Crimea and then the eastern part of Ukraine. And uh, then they show the so-called uh, fake terrorist threat, which, according to them, comes from Islam. Yes, so uh, there are mainly two um, uh, enemies pointed uh, out by the neoconservative authoritarian regime here. And the regime uses uh, this... Uh, let's say, feeling of uh, danger, feeling of uh, external threat to control the people and to show that uh, they are the only ones who can uh, guarantee the safety of uh, the people, their lives, their property and so on. Yeah. Um, I remember that last time you were in Iran and I had an interview with you in my program. At the same time, uh, our brother Emmanuel Oxenreiter was here and then I had an interview with him. And he also has been terribly harassed by the, the US deep state uh, through Poland, uh, paradoxically. Talk about what happened to Emanuel Oxenreiter, who he is, he's German, he has a voice, he has a publication, and how have they been able to clamp him down? Well, first of all, uh, Manuel is uh, one of my best friends and comrades. Uh, uh, I'm very happy that uh, our friendship actually started in uh, Iran. So thanks to you and uh, to your conference, uh, there was a kind of uh, a new era of, uh, let's say, Polish-German cooperation when it comes to anti-system oppos opposition in, in, in both countries. We started several projects together. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, Poland is used uh, by the US uh, as a regime who, which is able to repress also citizens of other countries. Uh, this is the case of Manuel. So, uh, Polish prosecutors, uh, National Prosecutor's Office is uh, used by uh, external forces uh, to repress, to suppress the um, opposition activist, the dissident activist from Germany, yes. Uh, I only regret, I can only tell that I really regret that uh, the German authorities cannot uh, defend their own citizen because, because it means that they are also dependent on the, uh, let's say, external forces, yes? So uh, they have to fulfill the uh, really pitiful orders from uh, Poland and to, to, to uh, take part in the uh, repressions against their own citizens, German citizens. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to Poland being used as an instrument by uh, external forces against the citizens of other countries, 
uh, you have to notice now that uh, unfortunately any citizen after the case of Manuel Oxenide, uh, every citizen of uh, any European Union country cannot feel safe uh, traveling or being active on the territory of Poland. Uh, this is the problem now, yes, that uh, uh, Poland being the member of European Union is uh, again used and abused by uh, the US ne neoconservatives as a kind of uh, Trojan horse, we could call it, inside the EU. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, first, this is the case of Manuel Oxenite. Second, we have uh, several cases of uh, and the citizens of uh, Russian Federation who are banned from entering European Union on the request at the request of Polish authorities. Yes, so uh, no other European Union country puts so many Russian citizens on the so-called blacklist of European Union. But Poland being a member first of European Union, then being uh, the member of the Schengen zone, uh, can put everyone without any evidence, of course, without any uh, clues that someone might be a threat for national security, can, according to the European law, put everyone, every citizen uh, of any country, an Iranian, of course, also a Russian citizen and so on, on the blacklist of the whole European Union. And that's also a very useful role from the uh, Poland place from the point of view of the interests of uh, neoconservatives in the US. Because actually, I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, all those blacklists of pe people banned from entering European Union uh, come from the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, which is just uh, sending the lists and sending their wishes to the Polish authorities. This is the status Poland now has. Let me let me ask uh, a question that is off many people's minds, but I'd like to ask it from you because you are dwelling on so many different. Um, ideas and you've been you've, you've you've sacrificed your freedom to express yourself and the realities of today imagine just imagine that the u.s goes through an internal revolution which it looks pretty weird right now the the u.s is very divided and many predict that things might happen they even make series about this the series the revolution is is like that after america breaks down Imagine America breaks down and collapses. What would happen to Europe? What would happen to Germany? What would happen to Poland? Imagine that and, and, and share that uh, prediction with us. Well, first and foremost, uh, I'm sure that uh, either whole Europe will be free and liberated from uh, any kind of external influences. Uh, either we'll all be somehow uh, controlled from the outside, which means that... Uh, well, I had a lot of debates with, uh, for instance, my German friends, uh, including Manuel Oxenheide, and uh, we came to a conclusion that uh, as Germany is uh, the leading economic power within the European Union, mm, well, the first step of uh, liberating Europe should come from Germany, actually. So if Germany would be somehow independent, it could, uh, let's say, persuade uh, other European Union countries to regain their independence from the US as well. But when it comes to the predictions about the US and uh, uh, the internal situation there, well, you are the, the expert on uh, the situation in the United States, uh, you know it better than me, that there is a kind of uh, deep state or deep government uh, inside there. And uh, actually, uh, well, we had uh, pretty interesting uh, statements made by uh, Donald Trump some time ago, uh, for instance, about Russia. Yes, I'm not speaking about Iran, because uh, when it comes to Iran, unfortunately, it seems that uh, from the very beginning, uh, Trump was uh, under the huge influence of his, uh, uh, let's say, Zionist family, like uh, Jared uh, Kushner, his, uh, the, the, the husband of, uh, of his daughter, yes? Uh, anyway, uh, we might say that uh, if United States would become a kind of uh, independent country, a country which would not interfere, which would not be an instrument of corporations and of uh, the whole, the so-called uh, deep state, which is behind everything uh, America does now, uh, we would have a multipolar world, a world in which uh, Europe as such 
would be an equal partner to Russia, to uh, China, to Iran, to all other regional uh, powers um, throughout the world. And we would have a world of uh, balance, a world of balanced international relations, a world in which uh, no one would impose his uh, own, let's say, cultural code, uh, religious code uh, on the others, on the other civilizations and uh, religions. So uh, hopefully it will it will happen when it comes to United States. One day they will become a normal country because, well, uh, uh, to be honest, when it comes to me, uh, it seems that from the political scientist point of view, United States, uh, it's not a country, it's a kind of uh, military corporation which uh, defends the interests of uh, global financial superpowers, yes? So it's just a, um, an instrument, yes? This is not a structure, this is not a state, which for instance uh, is based on the philosophy of defending uh, its own citizens and uh, let's say uh, building uh, its own power for, for its own people, yes? It's a state which is a and the, the history clearly shows that it's a state that is used and is a simple instrument of those who are behind it. Those who are in the deep, deep government uh, or deep state, those who are behind the deep state, which means the multinational uh, financial, mostly financial uh, corporations who operate uh, this country. And this is a kind of, let's say, security company which uh, secures and guarantees the interests of international capital all over the world, uh, but it's not a normal state. So uh, let's wish uh, the Americans that the US will once become a normal state, an ordinary state, which uh, cares about its own citizens and not about the interests of, uh, of the very few who run the international uh, multinational corporations. Um, you know, there was an article in the Israeli uh, newspaper Haaretz some time ago, which I read because it concerned us. Um, it's called uh, the Anti-Semitism Fest, meaning festival, where Russian spies Code Pink, David Duke, and the Nation of Islam make friends and influence people. This was out May 14, 2019, and it goes on saying, when a former U.S. intelligence officer was charged with spying for Iran, attention focused on the Tehran conference where she was radicalized. Meet New Horizon, bizarre collage of neo-Nazis and anti-imperialists, recruiters for Russian subversion and unmitigated anti-Semitism, etc., etc. And on page four of this uh, uh, article, it goes into you and discusses you. It says, uh, but it's not just for Iran that the conference have become a recruitment pool for subversion and fascism bonanza. Matthias Piscorsi was a repeat visitor to New Horizon conferences, a Polish activist who set up a Duginist think tank in Warsaw. Piscorsi went on to monitor fraudulent elections in Crimea and then set up his own party, aiming to fuse left and right into a, a liberal populist movement. This guy, who's a, a, a weirdo in Portland, Oregon, uh, I, don't th I don't think he knows much history, but he goes on to say, then there was Piscorsi's pal, German journalist, Manuel Oxenreiter, who also founded a Duganist think tank. You can see the r Russophobia in this uh, probably Israeli uh, writers writing all the way from uh, Portland, Oregon for the Israeli paper. Um, I wanted to as, as a repeat of my past question, but it's, you know, when the Haaretz write something, they're very angry. And they're very upset that in Tehran, there was a gathering of very diverse people, including yourself. And uh, they blame the conference all for recruitment. I mean, a lot of BS like that. Um, and everything about New Horizon is very uh, unclandestine. It's, it's, it's very, very apparent, very... There's nothing clandestine about it. Uh, and so you know that they're hurt. And they were hurt because four months ago they sanctioned the conference. And after one of those conferences, um, they found different reasons, connected you to Russia, et cetera, and they put you in, in jail. Um, what is our duty? What is our duty towards 
little people as this guy uh, who write and try to divert attention and try to divert attention from a coalition of thinkers from the all, all over the world who are, who are gathered there to, to talk about what's going on. And the gathering is, is in Iran, which was the first country after many, many years to defy the hegemony of the U.S. and stood by it up, up to this day. You know, and I'm sure you had a lot of time to think about this, this, this confrontation, this uh, line of defense, uh, and how angry they are. I mean, whenever I uh, get very tired, I look at this Haaretz article, and uh, when I read it, I laugh a little bit, and I sort of enjoy the fact that they're ang angry, and I know that we've done something. When I think, what have we done? What have we accomplished, myself and my colleagues, my wife and everyone? Then I realize when I see how, how angry and I see the smoke rising from their ears, I realize we've done something. And you're the one, one of those who participated, and they slandered you again here. And uh, so what's going on in terms of, um, in terms of their anger? What, what are they so angry about? Well, first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate you because uh, the whole thing that uh, you are sanctioned by the U.S., by um, the Treasury Secretary, yes, from what I remember, of, of the United States, uh, well, it's, it's a clear sign that they really appreciate what you do. And so, so you have already achieved uh, really very much uh, I think that no other conference uh, in Iran and uh, in the whole Middle East uh, was perceived uh, as being so influential by the uh, United States and uh, the highest authorities of uh, American uh, deep state as uh, your conference. So I really sincerely congratulate you and uh, urge you to continue the good work, the, the work of uh, New Horizons conference. Uh, because, uh, yes, really, sometimes, you know, it's it's very hard to gather people from different political camps, having different political biographies, different political agenda here in Europe. Yes, sometimes uh, here in Europe or in the United States, because of, uh, you know, several, uh, let's say, personal conflict, inter-party conflicts and so on, uh, we cannot talk to each other or we have some, uh, let's say, uh, limits uh, when it comes to the pressure of uh, uh, our political circles, our political milieu. And uh, the New Horizons conference gave a unique um, opportunity for all those who, um, who are real dissidents in the West in uh, different countries of, of the West, of, uh, of the European Union, of United States and so on, to gather together, to uh, know each other, to learn about each other more than we could do that in Europe. So, so you created something which is not only uh, very important for, for Iran as such, yes, uh, of course it's a, it's a big, a big thing, big, big deal for Iran that uh, Iran for all independent thinkers, independent activists, uh, dissidents, uh, becomes a kind of a center, thanks to you and to, to your initiative, yes, to New Horizons Conference. And uh, that is why, I guess, uh, they fear so much. That is why they uh, think uh, that uh, New Horizons Conference is such a threat for them, because uh, uh, thanks to New Horizons, thanks to um, the meetings you organized, the conference, uh, you give uh, to the Europeans uh, the opportunity to meet together in a, a neutral, but very friendly place uh, and uh, to discuss the prospects of their cooperation. Uh, I personally know, maybe we will not tell about it here publicly, but I personally know that uh, several new initiatives, not necessarily connected to Iran or Middle East, uh, have been inspired all uh, have been invented during uh, your conferences in uh, Tehran. So uh, this is the huge role for all uh, dissident world uh, of the West uh, uh, you play. And uh, that's why it should be obvious for you and uh, for everyone that uh, uh, they uh, perceive the New Horizons conference as a real threat 
to their own monopoly, to their monopoly of uh, power, to their monopoly in the media, and uh, to the monopoly of their political mm, and uh, cultural narrative they present. Yes, uh, that's why. Uh, well, the, the, the guy from Haaretz newspaper, I guess, is uh, just one of the very many journalists who are ordered by their uh, chiefs, by their bosses in, in different newspapers and uh, in different media uh, to write something about New Horizons, to write about the people who participate in the conference and to create this, uh, let's, say, let's say, kind of pressure uh, on all those who intend and who would like uh, to come and to participate in New Horizons conference in the future by showing that, for instance, uh, well, the people who participated in that conference, like uh, Mateusz Piskowski, for instance, were then put in jail because of their cooperation and ties with Russia, yes, which, which, which is suspicious itself, yes. So they use or abuse uh, such uh, arguments uh, to, let's say, to frighten people, to frighten people, uh, to frighten all those who uh, would be ready and willing to participate in New Horizons conference on the one hand. But on the other hand, I think it's a, a real good uh, recommendation and uh, even I would say a free advertisement for you and your conference. If you read such a, such an article in in such a such a newspaper as, as Haaretz is, yes, a Zionist one, it's a, a real good recommendation that they uh, devote a uh, so uh, lengthy text, le lengthy article to, to the conference, that they do do pay so much attention to it. I know that also several uh, US media, US newspapers have written a lot about you and about uh, the New Horizons conference. So uh, they really appreciate what you do, uh, which means that you are really uh, effective, efficient and uh, uh, you have done uh, a lot of uh, good work uh, for all the anti-system uh, movements, uh, anti-US and uh, sovereignists uh, uh, all over the world, including Europe, including Poland. And here I would like uh, to thank you once more for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate in a New Horizons conference, uh, which uh, was really a great experience for me. And as I have told you, I made a lot of new friendships there. Uh, also with the Europeans who theoretically they they live just uh, several hundreds kilometers from me, yes, but uh, for the first time I met several of them uh, in Tehran. So you give this opportunity for all the freely uh, thinking people from all over the world. Uh, Matthew Spiskorski, thank you so much for taking part in this interview. I'm so happy to see you healthy. I'm so happy to see you thank back you back with your family. Uh, and what you have to say is important because you, you've, you've been through so long and thank God you're still young. Uh, I hope you have another crack at the, the parliament in Poland uh, and we'll, we'll see more of you in the future. Things are not going to be the way they are today. It's, things are changing. Well, I, I really hope that, uh, well, first, uh, first and foremost, uh, we are all young and willing, yes? So our, our mind and our soul is young. Uh, and uh, uh, I really appreciate what, what you are doing now. And uh, when it comes to your show, I uh, really would like all the Europeans, and I, would, I, will, I will recommend your, your, your show as one of the most uh, um, interesting uh, alternative media channels for all uh, English-speaking Europeans. Uh, that's the, the, the thing we should do now. And uh, I hope that uh, the voice of freedom coming from Iran will be more and more popular also in uh, all European Union countries here. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you for your attention. Piscorsi remains a free voice in Central Europe and his influence among other intellectual dissidents will continue to intimidate the deep state. And that's too bad. <laughs>